The wild American frontier has produced many legends who have battled against nature and beasts. But one stands above all others and is commonly known as the King of the Wild Frontier. This is the history of Davy Crockett. David Crockett was born on the 17th of August 1786 in modern Greene County, Tennessee and was named after his grandfather who had been killed in 1777 at their home near modern Rogersville by Creeks and Chickamauga Cherokees led by war chief Dragon Canoe. David's father, John, was one of the over-mountain men who fought at the Battle of Kings Mountain during the American Revolutionary War. After the war, John continually struggled to make ends meet, and the Crockett's moved to a tract of land on Lick Creek in 1792. John sold that tract of land in 1794 and moved the family to Crave Creek, where he built a grits mill with partner Thomas Galbraith. A flood destroyed the grits mill and the Crockett homestead. The Crockett's then moved to Mossy Creek in Jefferson County, Tennessee but John forfeited his property in bankruptcy in 1795. When Davy was 12 years old, his father indentured him to Jacob Siller to help with the Crockett family indebtedness. He helped tend Siller's cattle as a cowboy on a 400 mile trip to near Natural Bridge in Virginia. He was well treated and paid for his services, but after several weeks in Virginia, he decided to return home to Tennessee. The next year, John enrolled his sons in school, but Davy played truant after an altercation with a fellow student. With his schooling being mostly a failure, Davy took up work as a cattle drover to help pay off the family's debts. In 1802, Davy journeyed by foot back to his father's tavern in Tennessee. His father was in debt to Abraham Wilson for $36, equivalent to over $800 today so Davy was hired out to Wilson to pay off the debt. Later, he worked off a £40 debt to John Candy. Once the debts were paid, John Crockett told his son that he was free to leave. Davy returned to Candy's employment, where he stayed for four years. Crockett fell in love with John Kennedy's niece, Amy Summer, who was engaged to Kennedy's son, Robert. While serving as part of the wedding party, Crockett met Margaret Elder, he persuaded her to marry him and a marriage contract was drawn up on the 21st of October 1805. However, Margaret had also become engaged to another young man at the same time, whom she married instead of Crockett. He met his first wife Polly Finley and her mother Jean at a harvest festival. Although friendly towards him in the beginning, Jean Finley eventually felt Crockett was not the man for her daughter. Crockett declared his intentions to marry Polly, regardless of whether the ceremony was allowed to take place in her parents' home or had to be performed elsewhere. He arranged for a justice of the peace and took out a marriage license on the 12th of August 1806. On August the 16th, he rode to Polly's house with family and friends, determined to ride off with Polly to be married elsewhere. Polly's father pleaded with Crockett to have the wedding in the Finley home. Crockett agreed only after Jean apologised for her past treatment of him. The newlyweds settled on land near Polly's parents and their first child, John Wellesley Crockett, who went on to become a United States congressman, was born on the 10th of July 1807. Their second child, William Finley Crockett, was born on November the 25th 1808. In October 1811, the family relocated to Lincoln County, where their third child, Margaret Finley Crockett, was born on the 25th of November 1812. The Crockett's then moved to Franklin County in 1813, and his wife died two years later, in March 1815. Needing help with the children, Davy asked his brother John and sister-in-law to move in with him and that same year he married the widow, Elizabeth Patton. David and Elizabeth's son, Robert Patton, was born on 16th of September 1816, and their first daughter, Rebecca, 
was born on Christmas Day 1818. They would go on to have a second daughter, Matilda, who was born on the 2nd of August 1821. By this time, Davy had gained a reputation for hunting and storytelling, and he was made a colonel in the militia of Lawrence County, Tennessee, and was elected to the Tennessee State Legislature in 1821. In 1827, he was elected to the US Congress, where he opposed many of the policies of President Andrew Jackson, especially the Indian Removal Act. Crockett's opposition to Jackson's policies led to his defeat in the 1831 elections, he was re-elected in 1833, then narrowly lost in 1835, prompting his angry departure to Texas, which was then the Mexican state, Tejas. With the Texas Revolution in progress, Crockett arrived at Nacogdoches, Texas in early January 1836. On the 14th of January, he and 65 other men signed an oath before Judge John Forbes to the Provisional Government of Texas for six months. I have taken the oath of government and have enrolled my name as a volunteer and will set out for Rio Grande in a few days with the volunteers from the United States. Each man was promised 4,600 acres of land as payment. On the 6th of February, he and five other men rode to San Antonio de Bexa and camped just outside of the town. Two days later, Crockett arrived at the Alamo Mission Station. On the 23rd of February, a Mexican army arrived, led by General Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana, surprising the men garrisoned in the Alamo, and the Mexican soldiers immediately initiated a siege. The Mexican artillery constantly bombarded the Alamo for hours, and edged them forward each day. Crockett and his men were armed with rifles and were renowned marksmen, proving their worth with each assault. There were limited stores of powder and shot inside the Alamo, and the Alamo commander William Barrett Travis ordered the artillery to stop returning fire on the 26th of February, so as to conserve precious ammunition. Crockett and his men were encouraged to keep shooting, as they were usually effective. The siege ended on the 6th of March when the American army attacked just before dawn, while the defenders were sleeping. The daily artillery bombardment had been suspended, perhaps a ploy to encourage the natural human reaction to a cessation of constant strain. But the garrison awakened and the final fight began. Most of the non-combatants gathered in the church for safety, and according to one report, Crockett paused briefly in the chapel to say a prayer before running to his post. The Mexican soldiers climbed up the north outer wall of the Alamo complex, and most of the Texans fell back to the barracks and the chapel. Crockett and his men, however, were too far from the barracks to take shelter, and were the last remaining group to be in the open. They defended the low wall in front of the church, using their rifles as clubs and relying on knives as the action was too furious to allow reloading. After a volley and a charge with bayonets, Mexican soldiers pushed the few remaining defenders back towards the church. The Battle of the Alamo lasted almost 90 minutes, and all of the defenders were killed. Santa Ana ordered his men to take their bodies to a nearby stand of trees, where they were stacked together and wood piled on top. That evening, they lit a fire and burned their bodies to ashes. The ashes were left undisturbed until February 1837, when Juan Seguin and his cavalry returned to Bexar to examine the remains. A local carpenter created a simple coffin, and ashes from the funeral prize were placed inside. The names of Travis, Crockett and Bowie were inscribed on the lid. Crockett's fate at the Alamo is hotly contested, and all that can be said with any certainty is that he died at the Alamo on the morning of the 6th of March 1836 at the age of 49. Accounts from survivors of the battle differ on the manner of Crockett's death, with stories ranging from Crockett putting up a heroic last stand to the account that he surrendered along with several other men and was executed. 
Davy Crockett became famous during his lifetime for larger-than-life exploits popularised by stage plays and books. After his death, he continued to be credited with acts of mythical proportion. These led into the 20th century to television and film portrayals, and he became one of the best-known American folk heroes.